For those of you who are watching online this morning, the title of my sermon is The Work of the Holy Spirit. Before I get into the scriptures this morning, I just want to call your attention to our Apostles' Creed, our affirmation of faith. We believe in God the Father Almighty and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. And we believe in the Holy Spirit. Keep that in mind as I work through this message this morning. The scripture that we have this morning comes from the middle of a larger section of scripture in which Jesus talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit. So let's hear these words from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 23 through 29. Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may believe. Beloved, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. As is my custom, I'd like to give credit to several commentaries for their insights into this scripture. They are the New Interpreters Bible Commentary, the Bible Knowledge Commentary, the ESV Global Study Bible Notes, and the Matthew Henry Commentary. Last week, we saw that Jesus was still in the upper room with his disciples, and Judas had left to betray him to the chief priests and scribes. That is when Jesus had his table talk with his kitchen table friends. Remember that last week I said the presence of wicked people were a hindrance to good conversation. At that point, Jesus, at this point, Jesus is still with his disciples in the upper room. This conversation this morning is a continuance of that conversation with some other conversation in between. Also, just like last week, the opening words of our verse of Scripture do not make any sense. We have to go back to the previous verse or verses of Scripture in order for it to make any sense to us. Verse 23 in our Scripture says, Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them. And we will come to them and make our home with them. The him in our scripture is Judas. But verse 22 indicates not Iscariot. Not Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Now Judas was a common name at that time and could also be known as Judah or Jude. The disciples can still love Jesus after he is gone by keeping his commandments and doing his works. They do this when they live out what Jesus taught them and what he himself demonstrated in his own life. Obedience grows out of love for Jesus and his word. Jesus tells us in verse 15 of this chapter, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And just a few verses later, here in verse 23, Jesus tells us the same thing, but in a different way, by keeping his word. 
A relationship with Jesus does not depend on physical presence. How wonderful that is for us. But on the presence of the love of God in the life of the community of believers. And the love of God is present whenever those who love Jesus keep his commandments. When they continue to live out the love that Jesus showed them in his own life and death. And as a result, the Father and Son will abide with us. How awesome is that? Verse 24 says, Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. First, let's examine the phrase words. Jesus says, the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. Jesus speaks the words that God gives him. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, <clears throat> Moses told the Israelites that God would raise up a prophet like Moses and that they should listen to him and heed such a prophet. In verse 18 of that chapter, God says this, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in his mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything I command. In chapter 7 of John, Jesus goes to the temple to celebrate to celebrate the festival of booths. He goes into the temple and starts teaching the people. And the Jews were astonished and said, how does this man have such learning when no one has taught him? Jesus' reply is to them is found in verses 16 and 17 where he says, my teaching is not mine but his who sent me. Anyone who resolves to do the will of God will know whether their teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own. Back to our scripture in verse 24. Jesus told his disciples that he and the Father will not manifest themselves to those who are disobedient to his teachings. And that, to me, is really sad for those who reject Jesus. To rebel against Jesus' words is to rebel against God the Father who had sent him. Jesus' words were not his own, as he had previously stated. Those who reject or rebel against Jesus are missing out on an intimate relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In verse 25 and 26, it says, I have said these things to you while I am still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Jesus came in the Father's name as his ambassador. The Spirit comes in Jesus' name as residence in his absence to carry on his undertaking and to ripen things for his second coming. What Jesus said in the earthly days of his ministry were only partially understood by the disciples. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. All things is the interpretation and significance of Jesus' person and works. The Holy Spirit worked in the disciples' hearts and minds 
reminding them of Jesus' teachings and giving them insight into their meaning. And the Holy Spirit does the same for each and every one of us. Jesus taught his disciples many great lessons which they had forgotten and that they would seek when the need arose. They did not remember many things because they did not understand the meaning of them at that time. The work of the Holy Spirit helps them to remember those things and those teachings. All of the apostles were called to preach. Some of the apostles were called to write down the things that Jesus taught in order to share them with distant nations and future generations. The Holy Spirit is promised to enable them to relay and to record what Christ taught them and said to them. Verse 27 says, Peace I leave you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. As a reminder, shalom was used by the Jewish people when they met each other or when they were departing each other. It's a greeting and it means peace. In his death, Jesus provided a legacy for his disciples. My peace I give to you. They would have peace with God because their sins were forgiven and the peace of God would guard their lives. The world is unable to give this kind of peace. The disciples will not be alone because they will live in the peace of Jesus. The peace that Jesus gives is a peace that derives from the heart of Jesus. This is his life, his love, his joy. This kind of peace reminds me of Paul's exhortation to the Philippians. Hear what Paul has to say to the Philippians in chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God, the peace of Christ. This is the only kind of peace that a disciple can know and will be comforted by. Do you have that kind of peace in your life? In verse 27 of our scripture, Jesus also tells his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus is telling his disciples not to worry, but cause them to find strength to face the new circumstances in which Jesus' departure places them. This brings the disciples face to face with the reality of Jesus' departure. Verse 28 says, You heard me say to you, I am going away and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father because the Father is greater than I. If the disciples are able to be generous in their love, then they will rejoice. And the one sent by God, Jesus cannot be greater than the one who sent him. All of Jesus' life and ministry has been made to make God known to others. This verse is a call for rejoicing when Jesus returns for the, to the Father because his revelation 
of the character of God has been completed. If the disciples had been more mature in their love for Jesus, they would have been glad for his departure. But their love was still in its infancy at this point. Jesus was in his humiliation on earth, but by going back to the Father, he would be exalted in glory once again. And Jesus will come back at his second coming. That is a subtle point in this verse of scripture, which is so often overlooked in the grand scheme of this verse. Here Jesus gives his disciples another reason why their hearts should not be troubled, for he is going away. Our final verse of scripture says, and now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. Fulfilled prophecy is a great comfort and support to believers. Jesus has foretold his death and resurrection many times. And when this came to pass, and after their initial shock, this revelation would greatly help the disciples in their faith. There are a couple other thoughts that I want to expand on here. Although the word Trinity <clears throat> does not appear anywhere in the Bible, the Gospel of John presents the Father, Son, and Spirit together, doing what no one else ever can. <clears throat> These verses give us the foundation of this, which this doctrine is based. The Holy Spirit is referred to by many names in Scripture. They include the Spirit of God, Spirit of Truth, Helper, Counselor, Advocate. Twice in chapter 14 of John's Gospel, Jesus says the Father will send the Holy Spirit upon his disciples. The Holy Spirit teaches and guides all believers in their faith. I have talked about the grace of God that we as United Methodists believe in. They are prevenient grace, justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is the grace that shapes us more and more into the likeness of Christ. Take note of this next proclamation. As the Holy Spirit fills your lives with love for God and neighbor, you begin to live differently. This type of grace is at work in us for the rest of our lives, molding and shaping us more and more into the likeness of Christ. Here is where we can see the important work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit shapes us more and more into the likeness of Christ. The Holy Spirit fills our lives with love for God and neighbor. However, the work of the Holy Spirit goes beyond all of that. The Holy Spirit also works in our lives convicting us of our sins and helping us to be repentant. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us in prayer when we do not know what to pray. The Holy Spirit will put people and things on your heart and mind to pray for throughout the day. Be especially in tune to that. Stop what you are doing and pray for whatever the Holy Spirit puts on your heart and minds. I cannot stress enough how important that is. Stop and pray when prompted by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is at work in so many facets of our lives. This is especially true when we read Scripture. How many times have you read the same verses of Scripture? <clears throat> 
only to read them again and have that aha moment. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Jesus told us, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Again, be in tune to the work of the Holy Spirit. The last thing that I want to mention here is the peace that Jesus gives us. That peace describes the absence of conflict and also the presence of blessings. Such blessings comes when you are in a right relationship with God. We will not be alone when we live in the peace of Christ. The peace that Jesus gives is a peace that derives from the heart of Jesus' life. This is his life, his love, and his joy. This is his gift to us along with salvation in his name. Let me summarize this message with three brief points. The important promise of the Holy Spirit should never ever be underestimated. The Holy Spirit teaches and guides all believers on their faith journey. The peace that Jesus gives is a peace that derives from the heart of Jesus' life. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.